The creed begins with the words, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Almighty, Omnipotent. The Latin actually is Omnipotente, which of course is literally omnipotent. Almighty basically means that God is all-powerful. There is nothing outside of God's power, God's might. Like most early Christian words, that word goes back to an ancient Jewish word which means God the all-powerful one, God who has the right to do whatever he wants within his world. That can carry very pejorative images. It can carry images of, of a tyrant, uh, of someone who abuses power. But we must not think of this in human terms, in the terms of a fallen human world, where power means often constraint and violence. We have to understand that when we speak of God as almighty or as all-powerful, we are speaking in, in far different terms than what we see in, in the power games of the world around us. In God, there is no violence, no constraint. The power of God is the power of love. Remember the creed says, I believe in God the Father Almighty. He is Father before He is Almighty. God is the Father Almighty. That Almighty nature of God is a great comfort to us because it is a power that extends beyond this life. Yes, He has power in this life of ours, but it goes beyond that into eternity. God preeminently is love. God is love. And so His great power is always exercised in behalf and in the service of his love. He is almighty in his love. And there is nothing more powerful in the universe than humble love. We can be sure, I am sure, that this world is moving to an, an appointed end because God is almighty and he's the Father who is almighty who bring all things to his appointed end. Here we find this very important idea of the sovereignty of God, that we are dealing with a God who in effect is able to make things happen, one who controls things, one who we can trust because things are under his guidance. God is the sovereign Lord of history and of redemption. However, it's important to recognize that the almightiness of God is not always apparent to reason and to our senses. When we talk about God as almighty, we often think in the modern Western world at least that this is quite an easy concept, just means God can do whatever he wants. Well, yes and no. Can God make a square circle? You know, it's a contradiction in terms. And often when there are things that we rather wish God would do, why didn't God step in and stop the Holocaust, for instance? Why didn't God step in and stop 9-11? We must recognize that although God is the creator, we live in a fallen creation, that one of the consequences of, of humanity's turning away from God 
is a fallen creation. And the consequences of a fallen creation, I think, are the kinds of things that we see in floods and earthquakes and all of those kinds of dynamics. If God's all-powerful, why did he allow these things to take place? And part of the answer is, tragically, that God is compassionately involved with the world that he made in the state in which it now finds itself. God's cruciform love is present with every hurting person, with every person who is wounded, for, for those that have lost loved ones, for those that have lost property. God is present with them. God is present in their pain. God is present in their grief. God is present in their sorrow. This is part of what the cross reveals to us, that God is a God who enters into the depths of our woundedness and our brokenness, and God is present there with us in it. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock That shadows a dry, thirsty land He hideth my life in the depths of his love And covers me there with his hand And covers me there with his hand And so God has to act from within and that his power, as St. Paul says, is most perfectly revealed in weakness. And that is a deep paradox which is at the heart of the Christian faith. The almightiness of God often comes in ways that don't appear to be almighty. And it's another way of saying, if you want to know what it means to say God is the almighty Father, look at his Son and see how God's kingdom came through the death of his Son. What we see in Christ is a power that is manifested in total a weakness, that the cross is the ultimate manifestation of God's power and God's almightiness. Almightiness is the only way God comes to us. God comes to us in the little baby of Bethlehem. In the incarnation, the Almighty came as a baby who didn't have a place to stay. The last thing human reason expects is that God would come to us as the infant of poor parents. And yet, that's how God came. That the Almighty God came as a baby. God comes to us in Jesus on the cross. That's weakness. And the Almighty God allowed himself to be executed. We always say crucified because that's the word, but in our language, it's executed. It's like going to the gas chamber. He was executed by the state. And when God was crucified on the cross, he was executed by the government. And that's not the way reason thinks an almighty God would portray himself. An almighty God would jump off the cross. An almighty God would do all kinds of things that are powerful and miraculous. We are speaking of a God whose power is made manifest in weakness, whose victory is seen in defeat, whose life is revealed through death. This is mystery. We cannot begin to fathom this reality that these are also symbols of God's almightiness. Faith means that you trust that this God that's hanging on this cross, who is in the hands of the state, who is being killed, is the most powerful one in the picture. That this person on the cross, who looks as if he is at the mercy of everything around him, is really the Lord and governor of history and the one who determines your ultimate salvation.
the strictly logical conclusion from the idea that God is almighty would to negate my will. When we think of the almighty God, and then we think of our own freedom of will that he seems to have given us, it is sometimes a puzzle in the lives of Christians when they ask if he's almighty, then why am I not just an automaton? There's no clean cut logical answer. In Ephesians, what, chapter one, verse five, he predestined us to be adopted as his children through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So if God has predestined us, um, that causes some people to wonder, then do I have any choice at all? But one has to put against that the other truth that is proclaimed over and over in scripture, that God has given to us a freedom of choice. We do not have absolute freedom, it is a limited freedom, but it is sufficient freedom. How is it that God is completely, totally, completely, perfectly sovereign, and yet humans have complete free will? Then it's that mystery. These have to be held in tension, and that is true in so much of theology. There are any number of conundrums, tensions, at the heart of our faith that uh, this side of eternity, I believe we're not going to satisfactorily resolve. Two ideas, both of which are correct, but which have to be held in tension with each other. Our minds are limited and our capacity to understand how things that don't appear to fit together might fit together is severely uh, limited. The wonderful thing is it's like two parallel lines. God's sovereign uh, choice and action and then our human agency, and he's given us that. And it's not like two parallel lines that must meet. We can't make them meet. They're parallel all the time. So it's as though we can say to a new believer, what happened when you became a follower of Jesus Christ was that you saw the gospel invitation over the doorway, over the entrance, saying, come to me, all you who labor, all, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So. In obedience, we come through the door. We made a decision, our decision. Once we got through the door, we looked back over at the inside writing on the inside of the door, and there it says, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And the wonderful thing is that both, both truths are there. God chose us, and yet we had the choice to make ourselves. We had to obey, we wanted to obey. We made a choice of our own volition but then coming, looking back, it's a family secret for the person who's become a believer of predestination. They look back and say, oh, I see. So his eye was upon me all that time from eternity. That is a wonderful and very comforting family secret. Then it's that mystery. How is it that Pharaoh can resist God? Because Pharaoh has free will. God gave Pharaoh free will. God made it possible for Pharaoh to harden his heart. So when you say God hardened Pharaoh's heart, you know, I think it's a statement that God created Pharaoh with the free will that enables him to resist God. We have, I believe, to affirm at one and the same time that God is sovereign and that he has created human beings to be responsible moral agents who exercise choice and have free will and undoubtedly at times will choose that which is wrong as well as that which is uh, good. The sovereignty of God isn't necessarily in opposition to that. One of the standard puzzles, and I remember writing essays about this when I was an undergraduate studying philosophy, is between what is often called determinism and what is often called free will. And uh, that's the very simple form of the puzzle, that if everything is determined, if we are really part of a machine, then when I think I'm acting freely, I'm not. It's all just determined. It's in my genes and in my memory and all the rest of it, so that in retrospect we could see that I didn't have any free choice about it at all. Most of us find that very hard to swallow. We really do think that we are actually free in all sorts of significant senses. The theological equivalent of that puzzle, determinism and free will, is the theological puzzle of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. And when you transpose the philosophical puzzle into that language, how is this God, the God we know in Jesus, sovereign over the world, and in what way am I responsible for what I do? 
the puzzle becomes more complicated, rather like when you're doing a jigsaw, and if you've only got 20 pieces of the jigsaw on the table, it looks as though it's going to be easy, and then you shake the other 100 pieces of the jigsaw out onto the table, and it now looks more complicated, but actually you're closer to a solution to the puzzle because you're never going to solve it otherwise. It's like that when, you, when we talk theology as opposed to philosophy, that it's a matter of saying, look, God's sovereignty is not simply that he's set up a deterministic machine and it's going to grind on whatever we feel. And our free will is not the free will of random atoms buzzing around or molecules buzzing around without any rhyme or reason and just bouncing off each other. We are given consciousness and we are given the ability to reflect, to imagine, to understand one another, to listen for the voice of God. And so the choices we make are choices we make which are real choices, but within the world as God has made it and within the world that God loves and wants to restore to himself. What the scriptures teach us is that God created us to find our perfect wholeness in a relationship of loving union with God. The operative word here is loving. It is not a coerced relationship. This is a love relationship. But a love relationship requires that the beloved be free to say no to the relationship. If the beloved cannot say no to the relationship, it's not a love relationship. It is a master-slave relationship. It is a coerced relationship. So God has created us for a love relationship, which implies within that creation the ability to say no, the free will to say no to the relationship, to genuinely say no. Here is the incredible condescension of the creator of all to put within our hands the possibility of defying the creator of all. The creature might rise up and shake its fist, our fist, my fist, against the one who made me. It seems incredible, but this is the biblical story. It's the way the story begins back in Genesis. God having made us in his image, and as the scripture records, relating to Adam and Eve with freedom and without any barriers. There is Adam and Eve representatives of the whole human race, and they're being given a choice, not between good and evil, because they didn't know what evil was, their choice is between going with God and not going with God. Are they going to be with God or are they going to go an independent way? And they choose to go an independent way. The creature rebels against the creator. Adam and Eve then enter into an act of disobedience that distances them from God and alienates them from God and alienates themselves from each other. It is a story that is played out throughout the Old Testament, the New, and into our time today. God is working his will. Human beings are working their will. But no doubt in my mind that God is sovereign over history, sovereign over the nation, sovereign over governments, sovereign over kings, uh, to whom all are accountable, and sovereign over ordinary beings like you and I as well. It tells me that our God is a great respecter of freedom. And frankly, I love freedom and religious freedom above all freedoms. God respects our choice, even when that choice defies him. God has created us in such a way, structures that God has put in place, those reliable structures. But part of the reliability of those structures is that if we choose to set ourselves in opposition to that reality, there are inherent consequences that are beyond our control that we're going to experience. I'm comfortable, I'm healthy, I'm well, because I'm in perfect harmony with the law of gravity of sitting here. When I step off the edge, if, if I'm on the, the roof, okay, when I step off the eave or the roof, does gravity suddenly become punitive and vindictive and retributive? No, it just keeps on being gravity. And I experience in my own life the consequences of stepping out of harmony with it. When, when humanity steps off the edge of the roof spiritually, when we turn away from that relationship with God, that relationship of loving union, does God suddenly become mean and vindictive and punitive? No, God just keeps on being the holy God.
in whom our own wholeness is found. And we experience in our turning away, both individually, collectively, corporately, we experience the consequences of trying to live our life contrary to the spiritual laws of our nature. So that, now you could say that the consequences of doing that can be very painful, they can even be totally destructive. We can bring about our own death by those consequences. And in one sense you can say, well, that's, that's God's doing because God has created things that way. Yes, that's true. That's true. You know, if, if, if I take a, a glass, if I fill this glass full of a clear liquid, and, and, and I, I give it to you and I say, you know, this is poison. Now you have a choice. You can set that glass down and say, no, thank you. Or you can drink it. But once you've drunk it, or once you've set it down, you see, the consequences of your action are already built in. If you set it down, you're going to continue to live. If you choose to drink it, you're going to suffer the consequences. And to blame that on God, I think, is faulty logic. It's the consequences of our own experience. Precisely because God is the one who has created the world, God is in that sense, and only in that sense, limited by the fact that he's chosen to create this sort of world and not some other. So when this world then goes wrong and rebels against him, God is not, as it were, free to say, oh, well, that was a silly idea, let's scrub that and do something else instead, because that actually undermines the very notion of God as the good creator in the first place. So it is like when a composer composes a beautiful, wonderful piece of music. If people are playing it badly, he doesn't say, oh, well, forget I ever wrote that. I'll write you another one which will be easier for you to play. He needs somehow to teach them to play that piece of music, not because he isn't the great composer who is actually almighty over the music, but because he is. So he's got to work from within to enable the healing of the world to take place. So it isn't as though God is simply looking down from a great height and saying, let's twiddle a few nuts and bolts here and adjust a few knobs and things over there, um, as though he was somehow detached from the process and this was just a machine, uh, this world. It's much more complicated than that and much more interesting actually than that because God wants to be compassionately involved with the world in which he has chosen to be active and indeed to be present in the person of his son. I think that what we see in the cross is the deepest revelation of the very nature of God's being as cruciform love. That is, even before God created us for this relationship of loving union, God already, in God's inmost being, was formed in a way to meet our no. That is that God continues to love us even when we say no. And that is a cruciform love. That God's love penetrates to the heart of our saying no. In order to keep available to us the option of saying yes. Maybe illustrate it this way. If, if this is that relationship of loving union with God for which we were created. When, when we say no, when, when we turn away from that relationship, we become autonomous beings. We become persons referenced in ourself. We are centered in ourself rather than centered in God. But this gives us an insoluble problem because how does this self-referenced being become restored into this relationship of loving union? The answer is it can't because any effort this self-referenced being makes to try to restore itself to loving union with God is a self-referenced effort, which by its very nature keeps us separated from God. And so God in cruciform love, in grace, in mercy, God comes to us in our alienation, in our separation, in our turning away from him, enters into that rebellion and offers God's very self in cruciform love in order to restore us to that relationship of loving union. But we are never forced. We can continue to say no even to that cruciform love. Calvin, Luther, and Augustine did not believe in free will. They believed in the bondage of the will. However, 
that will that is enslaved to sin is always active. It's always going. It's always willing. It's just willing in a direction away from God. So in order to answer the question of how God is both sovereign and human beings have will, you have to ask yourself what freedom is. Freedom for this tradition is not the ability to constantly choose between good, evil, good, evil, good, evil. Freedom about making choices all the time is a lower form of existence. God is ultimately the freest being. God is free. But God can only do the good. God cannot sin. God cannot do evil. So freedom is understood as an inability. The reason God is the freest is that God cannot sin. God cannot will the evil. God cannot be evil. So in this tradition, the human will is freest when it is rooted in grace and when at the end of time, it will only be able to love God. It will not be able to choose sin. So choice is not the definition of freedom. Real freedom is the love of God that's unchangeable. So that you are not going to fall, you are not going to choose evil, you're going to be like God, you're going to be unchangeably rooted in the love of God. That's what real freedom is, not our individual choices. Once to every man and nation comes a woman to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, some great decision offering each the bloom or blight and the choice goes by forever twixt that darkness and that light. Sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full. His command and all the stars obey. Christians believe more about God than simply that God is a Father who can relate to us. Christians believe in a God who does certain things as well. And so the Creed goes on by talking about believing not simply in God the Father Almighty, but a God who is the creator of heaven and earth. God the Father is the one source of all things created. He creates through His Son in the Holy Spirit. The affirmation that God is the maker of heaven and earth is an affirmation of God's almightiness, that God was powerful enough to create heaven and earth. He created it by His Word. He wanted it to exist. It's not a, a cosmic accident. He made everything that there is uh, and that he made it out of nothing. That he wasn't constrained by having to work with some recalcitrant materials, but he just made it as he willed and he's the sole creator and it's all his. He was not reworking some primordial matter that was already there, reshaping it into a new form. No, God spoke and worlds which were not came into being at the sound of His voice. He is the Creator of everything in heaven and on earth. For heaven itself is a part of the creation of God. It is the proclamation that God is the source, the origin of all that is. We think of God as the creator of the physical universe, um, which of course He is, 
but there's the other side as well the the heaven as well as earth the the spiritual realm spiritual beings not just the world as we see it but the world of space the world that's too small for us to see the world that's too big for us to see the invisible spirit world the world of our emotions which are not susceptible to eyesight all this he created the creed doesn't just say that god created the world it said he's the creator of heavens and the earth it's an astonishing thing to think of the standard question that philosophers ask and theologians ask why is there something and not nothing if you back far enough and far enough and it's bedtime and you think about it you won't go to sleep why is there something and not nothing? And then when you know there's something, uh, there is so much. There are hundreds of billions now known galaxies, each of which has a hundreds of billions of stars, and we could never even conceive of getting near the nearest one of them. One of the things modern science has done is to just expand our understanding of the universe in amazing ways. So the complexity of our universe and the dimensions of it are truly mind-boggling. So when you say uh, creator of heaven and earth, you're not talking just about a little tiny, cozy, petite corner of the universe. Uh, the Christians have always believed that all that there is uh, is from the utterance and the care of God. He is God over all of that. So it enhances our view of his majesty and of his greatness. By implication, we have a rejection of pantheism. God made the world. God maintains the world in existence. Without God, the world could not exist. But God is also above and beyond the world. So there is no separation, but there is here a distinction between God and the world. God is everywhere present, so we mustn't exaggerate his transcendence. But equally, we must avoid pantheism, identifying God with the world. He is at the heart of everything. He is above and beyond everything. say God creator of heaven and earth we're saying uh, anything that we can conceive of uh, the Apostle Paul talks about it whether it's visible or invisible if you can conceive about it it uh, is issued forth from the power of God well what does that mean uh, for us practically uh, it means all sorts of things it means that um, we're not living in some random meaningless world one of the things we see in creation is that there's an order to it and that order is necessary for us to be able to exist in life so that God has in a sense set certain things in place to nurture human wholeness just to narrow it down to this particular planet there may be other planets with other beings that God has created but let, all we know is this and the order that God has put into creation is reliable so talk about God as creator of heaven and earth is in effect to remind us not simply that God brings everything into existence, but also we ourselves. This has all sorts of practical implications. One implication is that if, uh, as today many believe, um, atheists and evolutionists, um, the world we live in is purely a sort of random product of, of something which has no meaning at all, then there is no meaning in life. And strictly speaking, there's also no meaning in our thought processes. They also are just random um, product. If this world were merely the outworking of evolutionary forces and it was a matter of the survival of the fittest, then much of this world would have no significance whatsoever. We could treat it as we wanted to. If it was merely the outworking of a happy accident uh, sometime in the past of a chemical reaction or of physical forces without any God behind it, then we as human beings are may be interesting but we're not unique and special in any way we're merely animals we're not just collections of biochemical reactions not at all we're not part of a vague impersonal mechanistic universe not at all there's a god there of love and purpose and of relationship who loves 
and who wants us to love him. And so the creation itself is full of purpose running through it. Take that out and we are aimless people not knowing where to go. Christian theology makes a very important point that humanity alone is made in the image and likeness of God. The human soul is created. It is not divine. It doesn't have a little spark of divinity in it. It is completely created. Here we find a very important statement, not simply about who God is and what God does, but who we are. There is something about humanity which sets it above every other aspect of creation. He has made us to be uh, maybe lower than the angels, but higher than animals and people with the capacity to relate to him and have creative significance like him and moral wills that animals do not have. And so it puts us on altogether a different plane. His image is that of uh, a moral God, a God of truth and justice and integrity, and he made us to be moral agents. Our createdness in the image of God is an integral part of our humanness, and an integral part of our humanness is our creation in the image of God, that they're linked together. We can talk about being made in the image of God as, in effect, an affirmation of God's ownership of us. In the ancient world, images of monarchs or rulers were very often distributed throughout the kingdom as a sign of the sovereignty or the authority of the ruler. For us to be made in God's image is in effect to be under God's authority. That's an amazing claim and one which has very distinct impact on the way in which we live. We are accountable or we are responsible for looking after the creation. For example, in the book of Genesis, we read that Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden to tend it or to care for it. And the idea here is that this is not Adam's possession. It is God's possession, God's creation. Adam is placed in Eden in order to look after that garden. And that's a very important image for the relationship of humanity to the whole created order. We are responsible to God for the creation. We are not the owners of the creation. Rather, we are its stewards. And we must give good care of this creation because it is God's and not ours. It's his unique gift to us, wonderfully resourced, and it's not for us to, to damage it or destroy it by the way in which we live. He is Lord of this creation. It's a reminder that we are not autonomous, but rather that we are under the authority of this God who has made us for his own purposes. We are, as Paul says, in terms of the potter and the clay. We are the clay. The potter determines what happens to us. The potter makes us what we are. When scripture says he made us in his image, it's in the context of saying male and female, he made men in his own image. And there is a sense in which that implies that we were made for relationships, not as cold machines, but as people to enter into intimacy and depth of relationships. To be made in God's image somehow means to have the the capacity or the ability to relate to God. There is something about us. We are made in such a way that we are able to relate to God. There's some kind of similarity, not an identity, but a similarity between ourselves and God. We're not just sort of freestanding individuals who can do exactly what they want, but, uh, but we are under obligation to him as well. He made us in his own image. He made us to resonate and to relate with himself. So we are incomplete without relating to him. Augustine, in his Confessions, uh, quite early on, has this famous statement, you have made us for, your, for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. From a Christian point of view, we are, as human beings, made in the image of God and made to have fellowship with him. The famous Westminster Shorter Catechism has the statement at the beginning, the man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And there's the twofold aspect there, the glorifying God, the worship of God, but also the, the enjoying of God and that our, our real fulfillment comes in a relationship with God. Lord of all life,
think about God as the creator, the maker of all that is, we should remember that, that God is not simply relegated to an event in the past. Creation is not just a moment when God said, poof, and the world came into being. But this creator God who brought into existence all that was not is the very same God who sustains that creation. God cannot be what Calvin calls a momentary creator, where he just creates and then withdraws. That God has to preserve and sustain his creation in all of its forms. God is interactive with that creation throughout history, including the calling of a people unto himself, the people of Israel, and from them the coming of the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. So providence, or God's constant preservation of the world, of history, is a part of the doctrine of creation. God enters into relationships with individuals, with people. And especially in the Old Testament, we find the idea of the covenant between God and his people becoming important. I will be your God, you will be my people. And this theme of a covenant between God and his people, between God and Israel, and then of course God and the church, is of immense importance. Because in effect it is saying that God binds himself, or God commits himself to his people. Because the Jewish people believed that their God had brought them out of slavery in Egypt, they believed that this God had made a binding agreement, what they called a covenant, with them. And the covenant basically goes like this. I have done this for you. Now here are your obligations to me. And that is backed up by the fact that this God is not simply a tribal God who happens to have pulled off a remarkable stunt, but he is the creator of the world whose purposes extend through the Jewish people, Israel, to the whole world. And in other words, it matters for God's purposes to go forward that the people whom he's rescued actually obey him and follow out what he wants them to do. This commitment entails obligations on the part of the people. Therefore, in the Old Testament, we find the commandments being given as an aspect of this covenant. If you are to be my people, you must behave in certain ways. Now, the story of the Old Testament is a story of mixed success and failure. And in the Old Testament's own terms, it's a lot more failure than success, actually. Now, it is true that throughout most of the Old Testament, God is, is uh, described in terms of Israel, first of all, Abraham, and then Isaac, Jacob, the tribes. Uh, there is a particular relationship with his people, the covenant people. The vision of following through God's purposes and being obedient to them never really dies. And so then the early Christians see that Jesus is the one who has been supremely obedient to God's saving purpose. As Paul says, obedient all the way to the death of the cross. And so the obedience of Jesus to God's plan then molds and shapes the early Christian idea of what it means now to be a follower of Jesus. It means to obey God like that, to obey the God we see active in Jesus. And so then we move from the idea of God as the supreme creator to Jesus himself as the Lord who demands our allegiance and our obedience. Not because he's setting us random tasks just to see if we will do whatever he says, but because the things that he asks of us are the things whereby not only we become more fully and truly human beings ourselves, but whereby we can take forward his purposes for the whole world. And therefore we find the covenant as setting a framework for every aspect of human existence before God. It means we behave in certain ways. It means that we live in certain ways and also that we hope in certain ways. And this theme of a faithful, reliable God who enters into covenant with people is immensely important for the Christian understanding of things. And of course, it's reflected in various aspects of the Christian understanding of society. There is a covenant between us and the state. We exist in certain ways, but perhaps most importantly of all, the marriage covenant is seen as an extremely important expression of faithfulness. Just as God is faithful to his people, so a man and a woman come together and are faithful to each other. As a creature, 
I am totally dependent on God, both for my mere existence as well as for my salvation. It requires grace for me to become a child of God. All of that is God's making and creating because the, the activity of God throughout history, whether it's providence, whether it's redemption, all of this comes from the fact that God made heaven and earth. Always the, the canvas on which this picture of God is drawn, always the canvas, the backdrop, is much bigger because he's the God, for instance, in Isaiah, who creates the starry heavens. Who is like me, he says. I call out all these stars. I number the stars. And he challenges the gods of Babylon. Can you create these things? He further challenges them. Which of you can foretell the future? I tell you, what is going to happen before it comes to pass. Which of you gods can do that? So while it is true that God is in a special sense the God of Israel, he is always much more than the God of Israel. He's the creator of heaven and earth, the one who holds the future in his hands. It's one of the most difficult questions that anybody can ask, which is to define the origin of evil. If God created everything, did he uh, create evil? In the Apostles' Creed, we very clearly are saying everything is created by God. Any form of dualism is being rejected. We are not to imagine that God created some things and another power the evil one created other things. Everything is created by God. There is at least uh, one hint in scripture in the prophet Isaiah that he created both darkness and light, uh, and one expression that uh, begins to lay the blame, as it were, at God's door. But that's not the, uh, uh, the dominant witness of scripture, for God is presented as somebody who is untouched by evil and in whom evil has no appeal, an incorruptible being who is not marred and, and does not create anything that is marred. Sin exists and evil exists, but these were not created by God. God created a universe that was good. Scripture reveals God having made the world and declares it to have been good, not just once, but time and time again. It, partakes initially of something of God's own perfect nature. And here we bear in mind what is said at the end of the first chapter of Genesis. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And therefore, Scripture will often suggest that the origin of evil is in terms of a fallen angel, the Satan, who gets above himself, who falls from heaven like a star, or that it lies within us as human beings who respond to the temptation of evil. It is we human beings who have misused our free will, who have in this way brought evil into the world. Even the cosmos, even the creation itself, we're told in the Bible, is groaning on account of the fact that we are not as we were made to be originally. We've departed. There is a multiple explanation, I think, as to where evil comes from and we can't easily track it down to one particular thing. One day we may know more about the origin of evil. The important thing is today not to track down its origin but to recognize its existence and even more importantly to know that wherever it came from God has given an answer and a solution for it to be dealt with. If my house catches fire 
it may be helpful eventually to know what caused the fire but the most important thing is to put the fire out first and God cannot be faulted on giving us the means of putting the fire out Faith of our fathers, living still, in spite of 